everyone, I'm Carlo, and first we'll talk about uh, IoT, more specifically uh, IoT on mobile. So uh, let's start. Uh, first, uh, to remind ourselves what is an IoT or what is an IoT device actually. So IoT device can be a smart air fryer, it can be a smart light bulb, a smart watch, smart speaker, smart thermostat, and so on. And what, the, uh, what all of those devices have in common, besides the word smart, of course, is their physical devices, they have sensors, they run software, and uh, they communicate over some network. Usually that network is internet, but that's not necessary. Okay, and why do we have IoT devices? Why do people buy them? Why do uh, clients make them? Well, they give some values first uh, for customers. So uh, people who buy those devices get some convenience. They can, have, they, they can get health monitoring. They can even maybe save money or they can uh, personalize. Uh, for example, if you have a smart thermostat while you're at work, you can set heating in your apartment. So that way it's more convenient for you. You can maybe save money and so on. Okay, uh, and why do clients make IoT devices besides the fact that people want to buy them, of course? Uh, they can improve their customer experience. Uh, they can, they, it can enable uh, data-driven decision, uh, decision making for them, product innovation, and all of that can lead to comp competitive advantage in the end. So pretty much all of this sums up to we as a business can, th we think that we can make more money. Uh, and those are the reasons why the clients like uh, Philips or Signify approach Philips to collaborate uh, on mobile apps uh, for IoT devices. Okay, so if you want to achieve a use case as uh, which I described, uh, you controlling your smart thermos thermostat from your work uh, with your phone, you need to connect your IoT device to your mobile phone or more specifically to, to your mobile app. Um, as we saw, there are many, many different IoT devices and there are many, many different use cases. So naturally, there are many, many different ways to connect that device to, the, uh, your, to your app. But we'll try to define some general flow anyway. Uh, so first, uh, you need to discover your device. Uh, this discovery can be, for example, Bluetooth search. You'll, you'll do a Bluetooth search and you'll try to find a device near you. After you find the device, you need to do uh, the initial connection or you need to establish connection between the app or, and the device. In Bluetooth, Bluetooth example, that would be pairing. Uh, next, if you want your device to uh, communicate uh, through network, usually on the internet, you need to connect that device to the network. Usually you would use your phone app to send credentials, for example, so the device can connect and finally, uh, there, there is a step that, that's a bit generic that we call sync. Uh, what happens here, uh, all of the parties who are involved in the process of connecting uh, exchange the data between each other. Uh, and uh, who is involved in that process? So, of course, if you're connecting IoT device and uh, mobile app, the dev both device and app are involved, but you can also have uh, cloud. That can be apps backend, IoT device can maybe have its own back backend that's independent from app as, and so on. And during the process uh, of uh, onboarding the device, the app usually serves as a glue between the device and the cloud. Okay, uh, let's get into a more concrete example. So as Marco already said, programmers usually turn uh, coffee into code, but today we'll show how to turn code into coffee with uh, our coffee app. Uh, so, a few things to note. Uh, the machine we'll be connecting to, the coffee machine, will use uh, Wi-Fi to communicate with our coffee app. Uh, the code that's communicating with uh, co uh, coffee machine uh, is uh, organized into some library, some module that we call SDK. And if done correctly, this SDK can uh, help you to abstract the communication with machine. You can even maybe reuse it in multiple apps and so on. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, the screen of a, co a coffee app, the dashboard. If, if the user doesn't have like any device attached, as you can see, there are not a lot of functionalities. 
So the user naturally uh, needs to add uh, his coffee machine uh, to enable more functionality. So uh, user would usually click on the button to start the onboarding process and then we would start with our first step, which is uh, discovering device. Uh, so, uh, first thing that we show on coffee uh, to the user is actually machine uh, de uh, device or machine picker. Why do we have this machine picker? So, user can select the exact model of machine he has, and we can use that model or that info uh, to guide the search. Uh, again, a Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth example, if you start a Bluetooth search, you'll probably find, I don't know, headphones, wireless mouse, and so on. And those are not devices you want to connect. So you need some kind of information to filter out the results. This is why usually you would use model ID or something like that to only show the devices that you want to show to the user. Uh, after user selects uh, his model, uh, we come to the part where the app is searching for the device. Uh, so, uh, one thing to note that the coffee machine has been put into the pairing mode and at this moment is broadcasting the Wi-Fi, which is named Philips Setup for this example. Uh, and uh, app is connected to the internet via network that we called Infinum, but this is not really important. And uh, at this moment, uh, device is looking uh, for this exact Wi-Fi Philips setup, and if uh, the, uh, the, the app finds that Wi-Fi uh, wi network, it is considered that we found the device. Uh, next, after we found the device, we need to uh, establish the connection between uh, the app and the device. So, uh, on coffee, at this uh, moment, we disconnect from the internet, and we connect uh, to the Wi-Fi that's broadcasted by the machine. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, we have one additional, let's say, step, which we call proof of possession. You might also call it pairing. Uh, what's going on here? So the app sends a request to machine that it wants to connect. Uh, the user has to physically confirm on the machine that he also wants to connect. And then uh, the machine sends a response to the app and the connection uh, becomes authorized. Uh, why is it a good idea to have some mechanism or step like this? Uh, because you want to know to, to which exact machine you're connecting. For example, if you have four coffee machines in your, uh, four same coffee machines in your office, you want to know with which one you paired or if you want to connect uh, to uh, your neighbor's machine, but your neighbor, of course, wouldn't want that, so he wouldn't confirm the connection. Okay, after you uh, confirmed the connection, the initial connection with machine, you want to, uh, to connect the coffee machine to the internet. Uh, in the coffee app, uh, we do a search for all available Wi-Fi networks. But one important thing here uh, is uh, to note that we need to select the network that machine can connect to or machine also sees, right? For example, your phone can connect to uh, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz networks, but machine might be only able to do that to, two per, uh, to connect to 2.4 gigahertz networks. So you have to take that into consideration. Uh, after you chose the network you want to connect, uh, we would ask user to enter the credentials. Those credentials would be sent to the machine. Machine, of course, would try to connect to that network. And if everything is successful, machine gets connected to that network. Credentials are stored in the machine. And your app also gets uh, reconnected with the network that has internet access because the, uh, the machine's Wi-Fi is not longer available for connecting. Okay, great. And after that, we come to the final uh, final step, which is sync. So at this moment, uh, cloud comes into play, and we are syncing the data between all involved parties. Uh, what does this mean? So, for example, we can uh, create machine model on apps backend. We can connect. Uh, we can link your uh, machine exactly to your account. 
maybe credentials for secure communication with uh, cloud are stored on machine, so machine can securely com communicate with the cloud and so on. And uh, if everything goes uh, through uh, without problem, we'll get a success screen, which means that your coffee machine is connected to your coffee app. Okay, great. But what now, since, since we are connected? We uh, can communicate with the machine. So, as we already, uh, we already said, uh, coffee app allows you to brew coffee uh, with your app. So, if user selects the coffee he wants and sends a request to the machine, how, how, how is this process, how does this process look? So, first, um, the app or the user can control the machine lo uh, locally, so that would be local control. In this case, when you send a request for, for example, brewing coffee, uh, the, that request uh, goes to the uh, router and uh, router redirects the request directly to the machine. So the request is never like uh, leaving the local network, doesn't go through the internet. Other approach would be to have cloud control. And here what happens uh, when the request comes to the router, the request is sent to the cloud and then cloud delivers uh, that request for brewing to the machine. But important thing here is to note, like usually when we are talking about requests, we are not talking about the usual HTTP requests. We are talking about more specialized requests. For example, one pop popular uh, protocol for that is MQTT. Uh, why is it used? Because it offers better performance than HTTP uh, and it works on idea of publisher and subscriber. Uh, okay, but why, why would we enable both cloud and local control? Why just not, for example, have cloud control? Um, well, since we are using cloud for this communication, it means that expenses uh, will scale with uh, use. So for every request, the client will have to pay probably more. And also, uh, maybe business or client will decide we don't want to enable cloud control, not only because it cost, costs us more money, but because of some safety concern. In this example, you can imagine uh, if you uh, brew hot coffee uh, on your coffee machine while you're at work, you might injure someone, for example, with that coffee, if somebody is around a coffee machine at your home and the client might say, okay, we don't want to, we don't want that somebody sues us, let's avoid that. And uh, he would say, don't enable cloud control uh, for that case, only enable local control. Okay, uh, besides the remote brewing, uh, communication and controlling machine enables us quite a, quite a lot of new fancy features, let's say. Uh, so on coffee, we have feature where you can check the status of your uh, of your filters and you can also get notified if your water filter is uh, getting low, let's say. So you, you of course buy the, the new one. Uh, you can also uh, set uh, the timer, which means that if you, if you want uh, your coffee machine will turn at exact time, maybe every day before you go to work so you can drink coffee and so on. And of course we have the usual suspect of remotely uh, turning on and turning off the machine and so on. There are many, many different uh, features that this enables and probably the client will think a few more that we will need to implement at some point. Okay, uh, all of this was great, but what are the challenges when you're trying to connect uh, the IoT device with uh, your app? Well, first, a bit from Android developer's perspective, um, one big challenge is, of course, different OS versions and even uh, some manufacturers uh, thinking, inventing their own stuff. So, I don't know, uh, for example, the Wi-Fi communication works differently on different OS versions and you have to take into uh, account of that when you're develop developing app and, of course, this is not making your life easier. Uh, next, quite a big challenge is actually accounting for all unhappy flows. So, as we briefly saw, this um, process of connecting the machine and the app is not st straightforward. 
there are, uh, there are a few steps and all, almost all of those steps can fail. So you, ha you have to like uh, take into account, can we retry some action? Can we navigate user back to the previous screen? What happens? And so on. And this is not only like exhausting from perspective of developer, which needs, which needs to implement all of that, but also from perspective of uh, QA, because they'll need to test all of those cases. And some, uh, some cases might not be easy to test because you need to get your machine to specific state and so on. Uh, next also a big challenge is also supporting the customers with issues. So uh, we probably know that not all people who use our apps uh, are tech savvy and uh, they might get stuck at some process uh, during the, this onboarding of the device. But also you have uh, other peoples who are very impatient and who will like only click next, 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 next in your flow. And that will lead to some strange issues. And then they can leave like bad reviews on the app store. And you have to like take, take that into account. You have to design the flows in the way they're not like too long, too confusing, and that uh, don't encourage such behavior. And also if some people get stuck at some point, you need to know how to support them, how to get them through the flow. Uh, one more challenge is um, uh, device or cloud problems. So as we saw, there are other parties involved in this process, and which means there are other development teams that work. There is a team that works on the device, so embedded team. There's a team that works on cloud, so cloud team. And sometimes it can be hard to figure out where the, like, the exact bugs lie, ex and it can be very difficult maybe to communicate at moments. Uh, but at least, uh, if nothing else, you can blame some bugs on the other things. And yeah, that would be all for me. Uh, do we have any questions? Maybe one question about additional features. Um, do maybe have the data, like how much are they used? Because like usually for the cloud. Yeah, yes, we do have analytics if you're referring to that. We know exactly how many times you yeah. brew your coffee <laughs> remotely. But like, is the big, is that like a big number? Because like usually a lot of people that I know, they're just like, just press the button and they have like an IoT device that connects with the phone and everything, but they just like, well, we don't, we don't know, like, uh, we only know uh, how many people use that feature, uh, those who have the app, right? Yeah. So if you buy the machine and don't download the app, then we cannot tell if you uh, are not using it or not. But yeah, the numbers are actually quite good uh, for this uh, remote brewing feature. Okay, thank you. Yeah? Uh, yeah, maybe if you can find technical details, if you can. Well, not, not uh, like into <laughs> deeply, I cannot go deeply into them because I might get sued by the client. You guys, like, uh, I'm just interested if anybody can give uh, a consideration of um, just directly connecting to uh, via Wi-Fi or using the nearby API, uh, which also does the same thing but like, but abstracts the uh, protocols uh, level up. If you did the comparison of which one is harder, you mean the you mean the local control and cloud control, or did I mean that? Uh, so there's a nearby device, uh, nearby. Um, I think it's called nearby Wi-Fi. On, you mean on Android, right? Yeah, on Android, right? And uh, basically what it does is an attraction over uh, communication. So the panic problem and the data sharing problem. Uh, it abstracts so you not worried about over which um, protocol yes. the connection happens. So it might be over Wi-Fi, it might be over something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Versus just implementing the uh, versus just implementing like uh, the Wi-Fi connection with you guys. I'm just like if you can share any considerations of pros and cons. Well, I can tell you that for this uh, this let's say current coffee machines, we cannot do that because there are some technical issues. But for new for new ones, actually, I think this feature is in, in exploration. So yeah. I think maybe it's possible, we didn't try, but for the, this coffee machine that I show you, we, don't, we are using just the standard Wi-Fi communication. We do everything manually. 
Yeah. Do you have to have to cover any update of Kotlin machine? Uh, you mean the firmware update for yes. the machine? Yes. yes. The, the client has to confirm that. Uh, you mean? Yeah. No, he cannot confirm that on the app on current version. But some features, for example, if you bought the coffee machine before we introduced this remote brewing, yeah. you you would need to up, update your firmware. But this is done like automatically for you. So we only have info if the firmware, uh, which version of firmware you have on the machine, and if the update is in progress. So if your firmware is old and doesn't support remote brewing, we'll say to you. Okay, you need uh, you need to update your firmware, and uh, again, user unfortunately for coffee machine cannot do anything. The coffee machine should handle the, this on its own, the, the embedded site. And if the coffee, if the firmware update is in progress, you will just get the info check other time, right? So there is something like state on the client side. Uh, you mean on the app? Yeah. Yeah, there is a state. Okay. I think that uh, the team that's working on uh, the other app, the Nutrio app, that has like uh, air fryers, they have more detailed information about firmware, and maybe they can even initiate. I'm not sure about this part, but yeah. And also, again, to allude to these new IoT machines, yeah. they they will have more control over these firmware updates. So there is no protocol like okay, I confirm and sending. On current current machines, no. Anyone else? You go on once. Go on twice. One question about the, the SDK. So maybe it's Philips or? No, it's developed uh, by Infinum in a house. Ah, okay. We we do we do use some components uh, that are actually from like Philips, but yeah, this communication between machine and. Uh, the app is like handled by us mostly. So I had a question regarding like other machines, but then you probably have to do it case by case. Uh, no, no, again, uh, uh, the guys that work on this other app, uh, Nutrio for smart air fryers, those machines are very similar to the coffee machines in terms of like structure and how we communicate with them, but they are not the same. They might have some different properties, some different ports that you need to update and so on. So the, this SDK that we have is reused, but we have special flavor for coffee app and special flavor for uh, Nutri app, for example. Any more questions? All right. Um, thank you very much, folks.